Hi everybody, welcome back to Glicklicher Kleine Dioden, where today we're going to be repairing this Issue 6A ZX Spectrum Plus. It's made it to me in pretty good condition. It has this blue serial number. If you know what that means, comment below because I'm not sure why it's blue and not green. It has all four of its rubber feet and the two supports, and that's pretty rare I find these days to get all four feet still intact. It still has its little rainbow sticker thing, the red paint on ZX Spectrum Plus is all there, so all in all, pretty good. I'm going to get straight to plugging it in and checking the current draw. I'm hoping it's going to be somewhere around 0.6 amps, and we're actually getting 0.8 or 0.79. That's a bit high, so something's probably wrong. Let's open it up. There are 8 screws to remove, which is twice as many as on the rubber key specy, so they make you work for it. And as with the rubber key spectrum, once it's loose, you have to be careful lifting the lid off, because the keyboard membrane will be plugged in, or at least it should be. Uh, this is the original membrane I can see, and it is actually broken, so I'm going to have to replace that. And here's a tip if you're working on multiple machines, pop the screws in a little plastic bag and keep it in the case, that way they're not going to end up in the pile and getting all mixed up. Now I know I'm going to be doing a composite mod at some point, so I might as well get straight in with that, because it's a quick and easy job. Let's remove these two connections to the modulator box, fold them over, clear the joints and take our 100 microfarad 16 volt capacitor. This one's very low profile which is neat. We'll disconnect the resistor from the jack and solder in our capacitor, snip the end and it's done. I'm not going to be lazy, I'm going to put the lid back on the box otherwise I'll lose it and plug it in and I actually got no video output at all. I'm sure if you've been watching these videos you'll know that the next thing to do is to check the voltages. I got some new probes for my multimeter with some crocodile clip attachments, which means I can clip, clip the negative onto the heatsink like this and probe around freely. First we'll measure the regulated 5 volt output of the 7805 voltage regulator. That looks good. Now I'll measure the voltage supplies to the lower RAM starting with minus 5. We're getting 0.46 there, that's wrong. Plus 12 looks good and plus 5 as we know is good. When we have problems with voltages, we tend to go straight for TR4 and TR5 and assume that they need replacing. But I'm pretty sure that we wouldn't have a plus 12 volt supply if either of those were broken. So we'll get the scope on the collector of TR4 and we should find that it's oscillating around. As you can see here it is. As far as I understand it should be oscillating between around about 0 and around about something more than 12 volts. And it is, so I think that's fine. I'm not going to replace those transistors. So I'll start by looking elsewhere in the power circuit for the problem. TR4 and TR5 I'm assuming to be good. And I know that the minus 5 volt supply is regulated by the Zener diode at D19. I'm interested in the voltage to the left of R79. So I'm going to use the scope to check that out. And we're getting minus 13.8. And that means if the Zener diode was working, it should be able to manage to produce minus 5 or minus 5.1 volts. But as we measured earlier, we're getting 0.4, and that made me conclude that the Zener diode needed replacing until I thought about it a bit more. In fact, I thought about it while the replacement was in the post on the way to me, and how could we be getting 0.4 volts from a dead Zener diode? It could only go up to 0 volts. So I think that the problem is downstream of the minus 5 volt supply, and the Zener diode is probably fine. Which makes me interested to check the continuity around the lower RAM. It's possible the minus 5 volts has been shorted somewhere underneath the sockets that have been fitted or within the chips themselves. I started by just checking adjacent pins and I found that pins 1 and 2 were actually shorted together. And on the other side of the chip, pins 15 and 16 were also shorted together. So there's definitely a problem in the lower RAM area. Let's look a bit closer. I found shorts between pins 1 and 2 and pins 15 and 16 while measuring this chip. And what we've shown is the minus 5 volt supply is shorted to the data in signal, which explains why the voltage is high, and also the ground signal is shorted to the cast signal. And the chip I measured isn't necessarily where the problem is. It could be underneath any of these chips, or within any of these chips, so we're going to have to start looking underneath them. Two of these chips are socketed, so I want to get those sockets out and have a look underneath to see if somebody bodged the work when the repair was done. I'm being very careful doing this because I don't want to cause any further damage and if there has been some damage caused, um, the whole area might be quite delicate. Here's our first removed socket. It looks okay and I couldn't see any problems underneath. 
That being said, I did do a quick continuity check and minus 5 volts was no longer shorted to the data inline, although ground was still shorted to CAS. Let's get the other socket out and check the continuity again. Yep, ground is still shorted to CAS, so I'm going to get the microscope out and have a close look before deciding to remove any more RAM chips. Let's give it a good clean with a surgical spirit and a toothbrush so we can look up close and visually check for shorts. Starting at the back of the board, I'm just checking the solder joints where I suspect there's a short on every chip. And of course double checking the empty joints where I've removed those two sockets. So far everything's looking fine. Um, let's check the front of the board. Now obviously you can't do a full inspection but you can have a look at the legs of each of the RAM chips as well as these empty joints where I've removed those sockets. Now these RAM chips haven't been replaced since the thing was built so they should be fine, they should have been fitted at the factory. It's worth a quick look anyway. And look here on this, uh, this chip, these joints are okay, I'm sure they're all connected but in my opinion I'd like to see a bit more solder in there so we'll address that later. Moving on, this chip looks okay to me, as does the next chip, and this next chip again is a little bit lacking in solder in the joints but by the look of them I think that they are all making the connections. I then got the schematic out and started tracing the cast signal around all the way to the ULA. It goes through a few values on the board and I just wanted to visually inspect all of the possible locations where it could be shorting out. I did have to remove the ULA to do this as well. Um, I just popped it out of the socket though, I didn't remove the socket. But unfortunately I didn't find any problems, so it's definitely not a short on the board unless it's underneath one of the lower RAM chips. Since a diagnostic ROM won't run on this board, I'm going to have to start removing the RAM chips and taking a look underneath. So I've removed three here and I'm going to check the continuity again. And hey, look at that, the short has gone. So I've either mopped up a short underneath the RAM chips, which I think is very unlikely, or there's a short actually inside the RAM chip. And check this out. The lower RAM chip is completely melted inside, I guess. It's fused and we have shorts internally. But silver lining, at least our voltages should... Okay, minus 5 is still wrong. It's at minus 1. But that's better than plus 0 0.4, I suppose. I guess I'll continue removing RAM chips but first of all I'm going to give the whole area a quick clean and one last check under the microscope. We're looking for signs of any shorts or any um, damaged tracks as a result of the work I've just carried out. There's one pad there which was a little bit folded up, a bit dog-eared, but it looks okay, it should be fine. Just quickly whizzing around checking every joint, everything looks absolutely fine to me. Out of interest I picked up a random chip that I'd removed and I hadn't tested yet and I did find shorts internally in this chip as well. So at this point I'm starting to believe that all of the lower RAM is, is knackered, or at least can't be trusted. So I'm going to cut them out. This is a method of removing RAM chips that you know are completely dead. What you need to do is get some good snips, snip all of the legs right up close to the body, and it will come out like this. What you're then left with is a load of legs sticking out of the board that we'll have to remove. But first of all I'm too excited to check the voltages. We should have our minus 5 volts back now. Yep, yeah, nice, minus 5.1 exactly, that's perfect. It's exactly what we expect. So the RAM chips were causing a problem. Let's get these legs out. Now you need to be really careful with this because I have pulled tracks up doing it. Although this is the easiest method, it still has risks. Just heat the joint, get your snips or your pliers, uh, tweezers, and remove the legs. What you do with all of these loose legs now is up to you. You might just throw them out, or you might keep them for legs for the biomechanical woodlouse army you've been planning on creating. Next it's just a matter of clearing all the joints, which can be tricky if you're clearing a joint that doesn't have a leg sticking through it, it's a little bit more difficult to line up the solder sucker. We got there in the end and as you can see all these joints are nicely clear. All I'm going to do now is clean it up and pop in the sockets. That's looking pretty good to me. Um, I know I said I was going to pop the sockets in straight away, but I want to do a continuity check first. If I fitted all the sockets and then found that there was a continuity error, 
because of the work I've done, I'd have to start removing them all and I really don't want to do that. This is quite easy to do for the lower RAM. Every pin on every chip should have continuity to the corresponding pin on every other chip, with the exception of pins 2 and 14 which are the data lines. That checked out, so let's take some shiny new sockets and pop them in. They all went in easily except for one, and I want to make a point of this, don't just try and force it in or one of the legs will pop out and you'll need a new socket. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm just touching each joint with a soldering iron, which melts any little kind of dags that are stopping the legs of the socket from going through and flows them onto the uh, joint, onto the pad itself. After doing this the socket will go in very easily, so easily in fact that it will keep falling out when you turn the board over and drive you crazy. You can use some tape to avoid this or I guess blue tack although that gets messy. What I did was just bent the pins in on the corners of each socket to stop them falling out. Now I'm going to tack the corners of each one in so that I can put some pressure on the socket with my finger and heat up each corner to make sure the sockets are flush because I want my specky to look nice and neat. Be careful that your finger isn't touching the pin that you're heating because that hurts. And after neatly seating all of the sockets flush, you can see they look lovely all in a line. Now all we need to do is solder the rest of the legs, pop in the RAM chips and see what happens. Ok I couldn't resist one more continuity check just to make sure that all the joints I made were good. Now I'm happy to start pushing some RAM chips in, luckily I have lots of spares. I'm just being careful not to bend any legs up or to make a hash of pushing these things in, which I have done before. And unfortunately I only have 6 spares so I'm going to have to go to the donor board to get the last 2. And when I plugged it in I got no video output again, and I can only conclude that the ULA is kaput. I plugged in this spare which isn't appropriate for this board because of the age of it, but it did produce a video output, so yes that ULA is kaput. And this board is a write-off, but I'm going to keep going ahead with repairing it because I can't help myself. The video output was there, but completely unusable, so there's another problem somewhere in the video circuit. And when I um, scoped pin 17 of the LM chip, which is the colour chip, it should be oscillating like a clock, and it was just stuck at plus 6 volts, so I'm pretty sure that the LM chip is kaput. Here is a similar board, and this is what we should be seeing on pin 17 of that chip. I'm going to have to remove it and replace it. This chip was a bit of a tough customer, I had to get the copper braid out in the end but it did come out cleanly. And here it comes, nice. Nothing seemed to be out of order underneath, I thought I'd do a quick check with the microscope just in case I was replacing a chip that didn't need to be replaced, but it looked very clean, no shots. Similarly on the underside everything looked to be totally in order. I'm going to have to replace the chip, but before I do that, in theory, I can turn the machine on in this state with that chip removed and get a grey scale output, and we do. It's obviously still broken, but I'm very pleased to see that we're getting to a familiar place from which we can do some more um, familiar diagnosing. Let's look in the box of bits, and yep, I was sure I had some of these. These are replacement LM chips, I don't know if they're new or new old stock, but they should be working perfectly because they haven't been used before. We'll solder it in. Lots of soldering so far on this job and I've got a feeling there's going to be a lot more to come. Ok here we go. Yay look at those nice colours, very pretty. Alright what are we thinking here? It looks like it could be a Z80 failure, possibly a ROM failure, possibly a ZX8401 failure, but we're not really going to know unless we can run a diagnostic ROM. Right now I can't, so I'm removing the ROM chip so I can plug in a diagnostic ROM chip which will hopefully tell us what the problem is. I'm being careful with this chip because we don't know if it's broken. And let's take our diagnostic ROM that we made in a previous video for a quick spin. It doesn't look good, but give it a minute, these ROMs are very clever and they'll still find a way to tell you what's wrong. It's buzzing at me making loud noises and flashing red, that's a good sign. Well, it's a good sign that it's a bad sign, but at least we know it's a bad sign. And now the board is going to fill up with 8 lines that are all red, indicating complete lower RAM failure. 
Well, I really bloody hope that's not the case since I've just replaced it all. In fact, this failure mode is very indicative of a problem with the ZX8401 chip. This chip plays a big role in addressing memory, so if that's not working, none of the lower memory is going to play ball. So I've removed the chip and I've fitted a socket, and I'm going to put in another chip and see what happens. I wasn't very confident at this point since pretty much everything on this board has blown up, but let's give it a try anyway and see what we get. Hey, it kind of works. I mean, it's running, but look at that text. It's completely garbled, there's something wrong. And this, I believe, is indicative of a problem with the ULA. Not necessarily that the ULA is dead, but possibly something to do with the ULA being an inappropriate heritage for this board. Fortunately, I did have a later ULA in my box of bits, but let's see what that one looks like. Hey, that's miles better. Although the picture still looks dim, the text looks okay, the ROM is running, and it's going to tell us that all the memory passes its tests. Right, we have a working specy. Let's do some standard servicing. First of all, we'll replace the caps. There we go. That was easy. And I've put the ROM chip back in, and we can see if it boots. And it does boot, although it's very dim. I'd say that's too dim, so we're going to have to address it. And there's a trick to doing this by replacing transistors TR1 and TR2, which are located right before the modulator box. I won't pretend to know exactly why this works, but I'm basically going to replace these two transistors with other transistors that have different characteristics, which result in the picture being brighter. Here's the type we're going to use, it's a BC549C, and we have to bear in mind that the collector and the emitter on these are the opposite way around to the ones that we removed, so the silk screen needs to be ignored, and they need to be put in the opposite way around. Let's solder them in, and let's see what happens. Here's before the change, and here's after the change. I didn't change the settings on my capture card, but that's a real boost in the brightness. Alright, let's turn our attention to the case. As I said, the case is in pretty good condition. It has all the parts, and it's pretty clean. I'm actually thinking about whether or not I need to clean it at this point. The keyboard membrane had died, but I do have this rubber bubbly thing, and I do have the back plate. Lucky for me, I also have a pile of replacement membranes, newly manufactured. I'm going to put one of those in, but first of all, should I clean it? I'm actually thinking about this right now, looking under the keys, checking out the grime on the keys, and trying to convince myself I don't have to clean it, but in the end I decided I should, so all of the keys are going to have to come off. And I'll be taking all of these keys and all these white knobbly bits, and the top half of the case itself, to a warm, soapy bath in the sink. And after a bit of attention with the microfiber cloth, here's what we have. It looks brand new, not bad. Okay, maybe not brand new, but definitely miles better than what we had. It's always worth cleaning it, and it's very easy to do. You don't need chemicals or anything too fancy, you just need warm, soapy water and a cloth, and you can clean all these keys to this standard. Well, there's not much more for it. I do want to stick a heatsink on this ULA, because the Speckies had a hard enough life. We can make things easier for it by doing this. It's going to sit on the ULA like this, and I'm going to attach it with this double-sided sticky thermal tape. I normally just put two strips of tape on the underside of the heatsink, and then get to work battling with the blue plastic, trying to get that off without ripping the tape off. Make sure the heatsink and the chip are clean, by the way, before you do this. And with the blue plastic off, all we have to do is pop it on the chip, apply some pressure, and it's on. Other than a playtest, that's about all there is to do. As you saw, this machine was a complete write-off, definitely losing money on this. So, if you have a minute, check out the Patreon link below. I promise that any contributions will go towards parts for speckies like this that might otherwise have been thrown away or turned into donor bots. Thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe.